And thanks to you all and congratulations for staying so late, last session on a Valentine's Day, um, for this specialized stuff. So let me ask you a few questions before I start. How many of you see chronic pain patients? About 40%. How about chronic pelvic pain patients? Fewer of them. How many of you are tired of that? <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> okay. And how many of you have heard of neurography? So almost none, very few of you. And part of the reason is it's considered still an experimental <coughs> technique by Medicare, if you uh, read their papers. But it's been practiced for about 20 years now, uh, more than 20 years, since 1992. And it's basically a modification of an MRI exam which helps us enhance visualization of the nerves, their anatomy as well as pathology. So we'll go over that stuff in, this, uh, in these 15 minutes. It's more of an informational stuff and the indications which are evolving, ever evolving, and what we can see and what we can't see. These are my disclosures. Most of these are expired except the uh, consultant for Siemens. So this nerve itself in the neurovascular bundle is the smallest structure. That's why it's been a problem. Most people don't see it. Even radiologists, they're looking in an abdomen or pelvis scan, they almost ignore it because it's so small, it's very hard to see with conventional techniques. And if you look at the nerve, it has its own architecture from an axon, um, to a fascicle, which is a bundle of axons covered by these Schwann cells and these fascicles together in this uh, layer of epineurium forming the main nerve. The fascicle itself is covered by this perineurium. So it has its own architecture with connective tissues, uh, with, um, with its own organization within the nerve. And we, we can see most of it except the main axon as well as the endoneurium, but we can see the perineurium, we can see the fascicles. And when you get a nerve injury, there are only a limited number of responses which happen. Uh, that's why EMG ruled for a while that they can grade this as from sensory loss to all the way to motor loss. Uh, but there are cases where EMG cannot solve the purpose because the nerves are very deep. They cannot interrogate. Uh, there are people who cannot get EMG because it hurts and they may have coagulation problems. Um, in cases of nerve injuries, we actually changed the whole paradigm. I was at Hopkins before and all the patients would go through an EMG, they'll get one, one EMG exam, there's some potential, they'll see deranged, they'll repeat it after a month, then they'll repeat another after six months, then they figure out something is not going right, then the surgeon will go in. By that time, the muscles will atrophy, so it was a frequent scenario. We change this to all to imaging, because we can make a decision right there, whether it's a stretch injury, it's a neuroma, it's a discontinuity, which we can intervene early on. And then there's a third set of uh, example, which is toxic or metabolic conditions like diabetic neuropathy, chemotherapy neuropathy, CIDP, CMT, all these diseases. And in these diseases, uh, there is usually a systemic problem, either hereditary or as an acquired condition. And they get what's called dying back neuropathy from the motor <coughs> axon all the way to the motor end plate. And in these cases, we usually do not image. We only image in cases where there is atypical clinical picture. Now they're coming with back pain, going into the legs. It's a diabetic patient. The HbA1c is not very high. They don't know it's radiculopathy, it's a diabetic amyotrophy, which is involvement of the lumbar plexus, or it's some sort of idiopathic plexopathy. So those cases we can solve. Or it's a patient who has developed lymphoma now within the nerves. So any of those atypical cases, we image them. And if you look at these chronic pain patients, they start with some local pain. Okay, I fell on this ice slate or somewhere and it hurt my buttock. Then a person did x-ray or MRI, they didn't find anything, they send the patient home. After a while, it becomes a segmental sensitization. Now this whole pelvis hurts. Not only that side, but the other side as well. Then they go to central sensitization. Now their whole body hurts. They go into fibromyalgia type of stage. So we would like to prevent that, or even if they had that stage, we would like to image and find out where the initial insult was. And I carefully look in that area for the muscles, bones, nerves, joints, everything in that area to find out where they have a problem. With this neurography protocol, um, this is an expensive study in the sense if you're doing a plexus, it's going to be a spine plus pelvis. If you're doing a brachial plexus, it'll be a cervical spine plus chest or neck, depending upon where the problem is. But in the long run, it saves money. It'll give you an answer which five MRIs won't give you an answer with or a patient going through physiotherapy for two years and three years, you may not find out where the initial insult is or where the nerve injury is. 
So that's where it saves money. What we are trying to do, it's a high resolution and high contrast imaging, meaning the slice thickness is very small. You know, on a 3D image, it's 1.2, 1.3 millimeters. And on a 2D image, the in-plane resolution is 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeters. So it's a very high resolution imaging that we try to achieve in that 45 minutes or one hour when patient has a scan. We try to suppress the fat so we can see the endoneural fluid within the nerves. We try to suppress the artifactual nerve signal intensity from that fluid and looking for those abnormally bright nerve, abnormally dark nerve, or fat within the nerve, or hemorrhage within the nerve. <clears throat> we have techniques which suppress the pulsation artifacts, so within the neurovascular bundle you can see the, uh, selectively see the nerve. And we have nerve selective images. For me, at this stage, I can see nerve everywhere, you know, almost like four or five millimeter nerve I can see everywhere. But what if, if I have to display to the surgeon? Um, with these images, you can display in long axis, just like in geography. And finally, we have uh, means for nerve quantification. If you're looking at masses, we can use a diffusion imaging, which tells us what the cellularity is or how much fibrosis is within the nerve. So these are the kind of images you will see if you order these scans. This is brachial plexus. You can see the symmetry on both sides. This is dorsal nerve root ganglions, which are the brightest. And the nerve drops to half the signal as soon as you get down within a centimeter. And gradually, it goes to normal signal as you get out into the more straighter branches rather than oblique branches. And these are the sciatic nerves with the fascicles, they're normal. And we not only look for the signal of the nerve, we also look at the size of the nerve, the fascicular appearance, the course, the continuity, the enhancement of a, uh, pattern, as well as perineural fat around the nerve. So there are a lot of parameters we look at before we come to a diagnosis. So here, let's look at some injury, uh, injuries of the nerves. This is an older patient who had a sacral insufficiency fracture, you can see on the left side. Now patient had sciatic neuropathy. The thing with EMG or nerve conduction studies, if you do sciatic nerve examination throughout the leg, it's going to show neuropathy, neuropathy, neuropathy. You don't know where exactly it's localized. With MR, the beauty is you will see most bright nerve right where the injury is. And it's going to gradually fade to normal, even if it's abnormal, distally. So it's very good for localization. And here you can see the left S1 nerve on a nerve selective image and non-selective image. Here you see the vessels and the nerve. Here you only see the nerve, which is abnormal. Here's a normal nerve with the dorsal nerve root ganglion and a dark distal normal nerve. This one is bright throughout. So you know it's neuropathic, it's stretched. What do you do in this case? You make a decision also for the clinician. That this is just a stretch injury. And if the nerve is enlarged, it'll take months. If the nerve is not enlarged, it's gonna take weeks to days and it will recover. This is a lady, older lady who came and she had injections for pneumonia, some sort of vaccination. And she said, one of those injections went into my nerve. I don't know which one it is. And she was in that uh, segment, um, segmental sensitization phase. So whole pelvis was hurting. And now you can see this is the inferior gluteal nerve, which is neuromatous. That's where the person had gone in too deep and injured that nerve. So that's the abnormal nerve here. This is a case where a patient had a boating accident. And this is, these are the normal nerves. You can see the preganglionic segment, the ganglion, the postganglionic segment. While in this case, patient had right leg palsy, the spine examination was normal, he had an MR spine. I threw in neurography sequences, I was uh, fortunately uh, protocoling this case. I was on call at that time. And you can see this is the dorsal nerve root ganglion which is stretched. This is S1, this is L5 which is torn, it should be here. This is L4, it should be here. This is L3, it should be here. So these are all torn. So when we find this much resolution and this much of nerve injury, now we can actually dictate or come up with new treatments, what should be done. Traditionally, these are not repaired in the lumbar spine. Mm -hmm. So we have a diagnostic algorithm. If you have multiple nerves involvement, it's usually a systemic process. If you have single nerve or one or two nerves and there's a history of trauma, if the muscles are normal, that's a grade one injury. It's neuropraxia. It goes to medical management. Within days, it'll be okay. If the muscles are abnormal, now you have the nerve, either it's bright or enlarged, you're gonna find that. It's either grade two or three injury which is basically injury to the axons or injury to the endoneurium. That also goes to medical management. The nerve is discontinuous, obviously, if it's a functional nerve, that goes to surgery. The nerve is enlarged, there's fascicular disruption, it's heterogeneous, that's a neuroma in continuity, that's a grade four injury, that also goes to surgery. And if you have a mixed nerve appearance, meaning somebody dislocated their knee and now they have injury to the common peroneal nerve, it's not an inside out mechanism where one, two, three nerve layers are injured. So in that case, it's dictated by whichever the higher grade of injury is. And we can find that out by neurography. Now moving to smaller nerves in the pelvis, 
This patient was suffering for two years after hernia repair. And you can see this is a genitofemoral nerve which is enlarged. And this is the whole genitofemoral nerve. You can see all throughout its course, anterior to the psoas muscle. There's a big neuroma there where they did the surgery. So there is an angle of triangle of danger and a triangle of doom where a surgeon is not supposed to go. <laughs> and they injured that going there. This is the femoral nerve, which is normal. You can compare to the size. In this case, this is a woman, and she has an enlarged femoral nerve, irregular appearance. This is called desmoplastic reaction around it. It was bright on T1, so there was hemorrhage within the nerve. And you can see this is the whole femoral nerve, which is enlarged, bright, gradually fades to normal. These are anti-posterior divisions. This is a denovation chain. So this was endometriosis of the femoral nerve. You can have patients with pelvic pain, they got urinary symptoms, defecatory symptoms, they have golf ball in their rectum, all sorts of things. You know, I read their PMNR notes, they're all over the place. And what you're looking for is this kind of scarring in the uh, ischiorectal fat. And you're looking for thickening of this fascia, that's the Alcox canal where the pedendal nerve travels. And this is a bright, this is the vessel and the nerve is always the posterior structure. And you can see it's as bright as the vessel itself, so that's a pedendal neuropathy. Or you can see the branch nerve abnormality. So here there is perineal scarring from prior mesh placement and surgeries. And you can see this is the inferior hemorrhoidal nerve which goes straight across from the pedendal nerve and supplies the rectum. And you can see that on the diffusion image also. On diffusion images, these nerves, when they're neuropathic, they really appear bright. So it's a pretty useful imaging uh, uh, for these nerves. This patient had five surgeries in the knee for common peroneal nerve. Entrapment release, re-release, re-release, re-release. Now they were suspecting there's something higher up there. She's not getting better. And what she had, this is the piriformis syndrome. This is L5 nerve, S1 nerve, they're enlarged, bright. This is a split sciatic nerve. This is a common peroneal component. More abnormal than the tibial component, it was split by that. Now I show you this dramatic picture. It's pretty easy to find on MR, on neurography. When they go for surgery, it took them four hours to find that split. It's a very hard surgery, there are lots of vessels there. We have other treatment which I'm going to discuss in a second. Uh, you can do all of that. When you're seeing multiple nerves abnormal, so here is the right femoral abnormal, left femoral more abnormal, the uh, L5 nerve, S1 nerve, uh, they are abnormal. And when you do a MIP image, you can see all these nerves. This is the obturator nerve. These are all abnormal. This is a case of CIDP. When you see this patchy thickening of the nerves on both sides. This is a case of chemotherapy. Patient had pains, more anterior than posterior. And they were trying to figure out what they can do. So here now you can see these, all these anterior nerves are very abnormal. This operator nerve comes straight down. It should never be bright. It's a very bright operator nerve. These are femoral nerves, very bright. The sciatic nerves were normal. It correlates pretty nicely. These are the burnt out myeloma lesions from chemotherapy. So what are the indications? The indications are anytime they have non-specific pain symptoms, weakness, if they have weakness, there's more, more of a chance we're going to find something. If it's just pain, it's less of a chance. Pre-operative planning before neurolysis for grading the nerve injury. If they have a space-occupying lesion, what's the relationship to the nerve? How much it extends into the nerve? Radiation versus recurrent malignancy. If you're looking for tiny nodules within the nerve, it's a very high-res imaging. You can see in multiple planes the nerve abnormality. Diffuse polyneuropathy conditions if they have atypical symptoms. Post-operative evaluation, a lot of these nerves go re-entrapment, especially in tarsal tunnel, almost 50-60% go back to re-entrapment. The cubital tunnel, about 30% go to re-entrapment. Carpal tunnel is the best, less than 10% go to re-entrapment. So in all those failed surgical cases, what, what happened? Somebody injured the nerve. There were three cases in a row, in a month I saw, where it, it's some center in Dallas, they were operating these carpal tunnels, and they were bifid nerves, they're cutting the other nerve out. So the patient was numb in the fingers. So you've got to be careful when you do these surgeries and we can evaluate these failed cases. And then prior to any MR or CT guided injections. So what are those indications? For diagnostic, we do local anesthetic, right around the nerve, perineural, not into the nerve. And for therapeutic, we do local anesthetic plus minus steroid or Botox in the muscle as needed in scalene or piriformis muscles. Now I used to do a lot of uh, perineural injections under MR guidance. So now the experience is so much like I see nerve everywhere. So it's much easier to do under CT. So this is sciatic perineal injection. This one is piriformis injection on MR. On CT you can do the same thing. And my fellows do it more, most of the time. So it's not that hard to do it, but it's just that you can be very precise with imaging. You're within a millimeter of the nerve. So this is a sciatic nerve which is bathed by all this local anesthetic. This is the contrast on the top of that. So these patients, we are not lifestyles, we are not life savers as such, but we are lifestyle modifiers or savers. 
So we can give them another six months to a cancer patient or a chronic sufferer by doing these injections. So last uh, few seconds, we did a study on impact of this neurography on diagnostic thinking and therapeutic management. These were all the patients who were going to go for surgery. There were about 80 of them we could do over two years. And we gave them a survey, you know, uh, like to the surgeon, what do you think before? And then we'll give you neurography results. What do you think now? So we gave them this sur survey. And they had symptoms all over the place, from pain, sensory symptoms, motor symptoms. Almost 30, uh, one third of them had previous nerve surgery. They were suffering. So they were going to go back again, because there's no other modality to tell them beforehand what's out there. So they're only going to go in and find that and see the changes. We actually prevented 18% of those surgeries. And that's under review right now. There were a lot of changes everywhere. So I think all these things, you know, when it's complicated, it's a chronic patient, you want to evaluate one time with neurography. Don't just keep doing lumbar spine, lumbar spine, lumbar, lumbar spine, like five MRs in a row. And this is one of those cases where this patient had uh, um, pain followed by weakness in the arm. You can see this radial nerve, which is swollen. And then this is the entrapment site. It's black. And then this is enlarged below also. So they thought it's neuritis based on clinical information. There was pain followed by weakness. But this was a severe entrapment on surgery. And they didn't believe us. They actually did intra electrophysiology on this patient. They said, if it's going to be entrapment, it's going to be conduction above, no conduction below. If it's going to be neuritis, it'll be same conduction. And there was no conduction below on surgery. So this patient did well. It took him nine months to recover. So we'll hold questions for the, uh, for the later session. Thank you.